Good morning, everybody. I sure appreciate y'all joining me this morning for this uh, three-hour workshop, kind of uh, looking into the future, as it were, about the addition of fluids as a unit in AP Physics 2. I sure appreciate the folks that have the camera on, and I understand that there's lots of situations at home that may prevent that, but I'd sure love to see you. I've still got some PTSD from those uh, <laughs> empty boxes. <laughs> I'm sure y'all do as well. Um, my name is Other Strotterman, and I teach AP Physics in Lawrence, Kansas. It's where the University of Kansas is. We're about 45 minutes west of Kansas City. Um, I do a lot of stuff with AP, and I've been down there, y'all. Been down there with y'all in Birmingham. Um, I did a workshop there with y'all in uh, the fall, so it's it's great to see some familiar faces. Um, as far as expertise with fluids go, I've been on the AP Physics Two Test Event Committee for the past seven years. Um, the last four is the co-chair and uh, writing fluids questions is what we've been doing for the last seven years. And so um, what if you've been teaching physics two, the fluids in physics two is going to be the exact same fluids in physics one here in, uh, in a couple of years. And so if you're saying, oh, I've got fluids down, are they, are they changing anything? Nope. And so this is going to be an opportunity for you to kind of confirm that if physics one is if fluids is a new thing for you all. Um, hopefully you're going to get an opportunity to get some uh, resources as we go throughout the course of um, the session. So let's talk a little bit about our agenda. So we're going to have kind of two main parts of the session, and uh, we'll take a little bit of a break halfway through. Um, may not be halfway through content wise, but we'll be halfway through uh, time wise, maybe at about uh, 1030 or so. Um, we're going to start off with just a little bit of a general review about some fluid terms and some fluid quantities. Um, just some things that kids probably know about already just from middle school science, but ones that we may not use, some that we may not use in AP Physics 1 currently, um, or some, ones, some that we do use in AP Physics 1 currently that we're going to have to really pay attention to when we get to teaching fluids in a couple of years. And then really there's two parts of fluids. There's static fluids and dynamic fluids. And so there's basically two halves of a fluids unit. There's half of the fluids unit where the fluid isn't moving and half of the fluids unit where the fluid is moving. And we can kind of think about that and break that up in our minds. So we've got static fluids and fluid dynamics. If we look at the um, new curriculum framework that's posted on AP Central site, it's going to be unit number eight. And I'm gonna switch over real quick and show you the table of contents for that. And I'll post in chat this link real quick. So this is the draft curriculum framework. And if I scroll down a bit, I'm gonna to get to the table of contents or not table of contents, the unit um, outline. And you'll notice that unit eight is going to be the unit on fluids. You'll also notice that there is a little bit of a difference of ordering of units and the removal of a unit or absorption of a unit, as well as the splitting of a unit. So you'll notice that unit three currently is circular motion and gravity. They've taken circular motion and gravity and absorbed it into the other units, not having it be a standalone unit. And they've taken uh, what's currently unit number uh, six, which is oscillations and moved it after rotational motion and split rotational motion up. As far as new content goes in those first seven units, there's not, nothing to write home about. But that unit number eight is going to be our focus for today, and that is fluids. And just a reminder that unit number eight is the same content if you're teaching AP Physics 2, if that's going to be an AP Physics 1. So these are the four topics in the uh, course and the, the curriculum framework that they post the draft one. Um, the first is internal structure of a fluid slash density, density being kind of the big one there talking about static fluids, um, fluid pressure, fluid pressure being um, not just 
force over area, but also the pressure exerted by fluid and what are some factors that affect the pressure exerted by fluid. And then when it says fluids and Newton's laws, it, they, it could just have easily said buoyancy, um, Archimedes principle. That's what topic three is about. So really, if I'm talking about statics, it's these first um, three topics. Are y'all seeing me, see me right on the screen? Am I writing on the screen? Is that showing up for y'all? Okay, excellent. Not showing up for y'all. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> okay. So we'll see if we can get that working. The last um, topic is fluids and uh, conservation laws. And really that's the second half of the, of the unit in my mind. The first three topics um, are the first half of the unit, which is statics. And the, that topic four is fluid dynamics. Let me see if I um, jump back out and jump back in again and help me allow y'all to see me writing on it. Is that working when I wrote test there? Is that showing up? Not okay. I'll see anything. I guess I'll just, okay, well, I guess we just won't be able to use that function. No worries whatsoever. Okay, um, so let's do a quick review, like I said, of uh, states of matter. I know that this is probably something that we don't talk about a lot in AP Physics 1 currently. This is definitely something that we're going to want to focus on when we teach fluids. And that is the three basic states of matter. I know some of y'all are, perhaps cringing at the lack of inclusion of things like plasma or Newtonian. Uh, anyway, uh, we're gonna focus on these three basic ones. And for physics, we call a fluid a liquid or gas. And so we're gonna cover liquids and gases in this unit when we talk about fluids. And I think this is a great little chart to make sure that we're thinking about in our heads when we think about um, what are some of the things or what are some of the ways that solids, liquids, and gases uh, are differentiated from one another? Obviously, the mass of a solid, liquid, and gas is constant, kind of a fundamental thing. Um, but the volume of a solid is constant. The volume of a liquid we are going to say is constant. One of the things that um, I know that especially some nerdy AP physics kids love talking about is extreme situations. Well, is it possible for a liquid to be compressed? Absolutely, it's possible for a liquid to be compressed, but it's not possible to compress a liquid in a physics lab. It's just not, you can't do it. You can't apply enough pressure. Is a liquid compressed a mile deep underwater? Absolutely a little bit. Are we going to have that be something that happens in AV physics? No. So when it says uh, liquid is uh, a constant volume, that's not always the case, but in any sort of situation that we can recreate in our lab, it is the case. That's why you have that parentheses or the uh, quotation marks for constant volume and constant density. Shape obviously is one that we're gonna focus on too, that we can have a variable shape for a liquid and a variable shape for a gas. But I think this is a nice thing to do to kind of remind ourselves about the three basic states of matter and the two states of matter that we term as a fluid in physics are liquids and gases. And we're gonna talk about both of those. Um, we're gonna focus on liquids. That'll be kind of the main focus, but we can also talk about um, gases as well as far as being a fluid and some of the things that it can do. So <clears throat> I've got some quantities here that are important for um, the fluids unit. And a lot of these are quantities that we know about, but there may be units that we'll use in AP physics that aren't units that you use in chemistry class, for example, if you're one of those, um, you know, jack of all trades that's teaching chemistry and physics. You'll notice that there's a little bit of a difference as far as unit selection goes for some of these quantities. The first thing I want to point out to you at the top are two terms that I think are really great to talk with your students about. The kids don't need to know these terms for the exam, but they're neat terms to teach kids as far as these four quantities. An extensive property is a property that depends on the amount of matter. An intensive property is a property that depends on the type of matter. And these are good terms to talk with your students about when you're looking at these four different quantities. because does the mass of an object depend on the amount of the object or the type of the object? It depends on the amount of the object, obviously. Does the volume of an object depend on the amount of object, the amount of the material, or the type of material? Well, it depends on the amount of material. So those first two would be 
what I would refer to as extensive properties. That third, however, is an intensive property. The density of a material depends not on how much of the stuff you have, but what type of stuff you have. And so that's a good, these two terms, like I said, aren't on the AP physics exam and aren't gonna be on the AP physics exam, but they're fun terms to talk to the students about. And finally, weight is something that we're gonna wanna really talk with our students about in this unit, because we're gonna have actual weight <laughs> and something called apparent weight. What I mean by apparent weight is that if I'm holding a heavy object with a spring from a spring scale, that spring scale is going to tell me its weight. Like if I'm, I've got a hook object hanging from a spring scale and just holding it in the air, that spring scale is going to tell me what the weight of that object is. But if I were to dip that object, let's say it's like a heavy, heavy mass, like a hook, you know, like a one of the, you know, like a box of masses, let's take a one kilogram object and hang it from it. If I dip that into some water, that spring scale reading is going to change. And that spring scale reading is going to show you the apparent weight of that object now. Yeah, so the difference between its actual weight and what the buoyant force is acting on the object. One of the things I'll tell you too is that um, it's useful to talk about if I'm holding a spring scale and I have an object hanging from the spring scale, and I'm doing that not submerged underwater, the spring scale is technically showing you the apparent weight as well, because there's a tiny buoyant force acting on that object because there is air, a fluid being displaced, and so there is a very small scotch of a buoyant force. We're not going to worry about it, but just, you know, AP physics nerds love talking about that too. The two, the two units that I really focus your attention on, and I sure hope my pen starts showing up for y'all, are the unit for volume. Yes! The unit for volume and the unit for density. That unit for volume is one that you really want to focus your attention on um, because that's not a unit for volume that you're probably used to. You're used to probably a milliliter, which is really tiny, maybe a liter, which is a little bit bigger, but we're going to use a cubic meter in AP physics. Excellent, Cole. Thanks so much. That's super great to hear. We're going to use a cubic meter. So that's a meter stick by a meter stick by a meter stick. That is one amount of volume. That's super important because when we talk about the density of things, which I'll show you a table here in just one second, those the density values are going to be ginormous in comparison to the density value we're used to. So instead of the density of water being one, which is the unit, which is the value you're most used to, the density of water is going to be a thousand. Because if I have this much water, that is a ton of water. So instead of one kilogram for a liter, it's a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Another thing I'd point out to you over here is we're going to use lowercase rho for the symbol for density. I know a lot of chemistry folks may just do a capital D for density. So like I said, two different kind of major fields of study in um, fluids, fluid statics, that's density, pressure, and buoyancy, density, pressure, and buoyancy, and then fluid dynamics, that's conservation laws. That's if I have water flowing through a pipe and the pipe narrows, or if I have water flowing through a pipe and the pipe goes up and down. Here is the AP Physics 2 equation sheet and the section that includes the fluids equations on it. And we're gonna come back and look at all of these equations throughout the course of this um, session. You'll notice that it also is the thermal physics, which is not, I repeat, not going to be in AP Physics 2 in a couple of years. And so these equations here and below are not going to be on the AP Physics 1 um, equation sheet when the equation sheet gets modified and adds fluids. But all of the equations above that are going to be on the AP Physics 1 equation sheet. Now, one thing that I would say just really briefly is that a topic that's not going to be assessed on the AP Physics 1 exam, but may be useful for us to talk with our students about because it allows us to do a couple other interesting activities with students is Boyle's Law. 
This is not going to be an AP Physics 1 thing, but it is an AP Physics 2 thing. And my bet is that kind of the traditional order is biochem physics. And so perhaps at your school, your kids have had chemistry before. And so you can talk about Boyle's law. Boyle's law is P1V1 equals P2V2. So it's just a, um, ex, uh, a, a particular um, version of the ideal gas law if the temperature is held constant. So if the temperature is held constant, if I increase the pressure, the volume decreases. If I decrease the pressure, the volume increases. And I think this is a neat thing to talk about because we're going to be talking about pressure and using it as an example of what happens to something if the pressure changes isn't super interesting if you've got, say, for example, a block. Like if I change the pressure exerted on a block, it doesn't really change the block. But if I change the pressure exerted on a balloon, it's going to definitely change something about a balloon. So if I have a balloon that's rising to very high heights and very high altitudes, that volume of that balloon is going to change. Or if I have a balloon and I push it deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into water, its volume is going to change as well. The reason it's going to change is something that's assessed on the, that's going to be assessed on the physics one exam, but this Boyle's law isn't going to be assessed on the physics one exam, but I think there's, am I right? Chemistry prior to physics for y'all probably, yeah. So you, the kids have probably seen the ideal gas law and it's something that you can use as an example. Okay, let's talk about fluid statics. So like I said, fluid statics is the study of fluids at rest. I like having, you know, like I, I'm gonna come, come back to the two big parts over and over again, because I think it's a useful way of breaking up the unit. The, the main thing students are gonna have to do is density. That's gonna be nice intro to the unit because hopefully they've learned about it in chemistry class. I'm sure they've learned about it in some middle school science unit. Pressure. This is going to be something that they probably have learned about from the ideal gas law, but we're going to focus our attention more on the pressure exerted um, by a fluid. And finally, buoyancy and uh, the crazy uh, naked dude, um, Archimedes. That's a good story to tell your students that Archimedes was tasked with uh, determining whether or not the king's crown was made out of gold and Archimedes was supposedly taking a bath, and he thought about water displacement as a way of perhaps figuring out the, the volume of the king's crown in order to see if that density was the density of gold. And uh, he said, Eureka, and then ran through the, the streets naked. I always tell my kids that he was naked, because that's like different than naked. Like if you're naked enough to know good, you're naked, right? That's surely that it's a Kansas thing. It's got to be an Alabama thing. I, I have no doubt. So let's start with density first off. Density is a nice review um, for uh, the kids. And um, one thing that we're not going to do on the AP Physics exam is go back and forth between units. But unfortunately, we have to when we're teaching about density, because the graduate cylinders that we have available to us don't have cubic meters on the side. And so for better or for worse, we're gonna to have to go back and forth between units. Or when you do a density um, lab, or when you do a lab involving a graduate cylinder, you may just choose to stay in that unit. Units being milliliters or cubic centimeters, depending on what's on your graduate cylinder. So in chemistry, we're used to more grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter or kilograms per liter, all of those three units will have the same density values, but you'll notice that there are some common density values for um, different fluids in this case, and what they're, and, and, and a solid in the case of iron, but also what their densities are. Students aren't gonna to need to know density values. They're not gonna to have to memorize them. They'll always be given to them on the exam. And the two most common, the three most common ones that will be given the density of air is a super common one. The density of water is a super common one. And the density of salt water is also a super common one. And like I said, they'll all be given to students on the exam and they'll all be given in kilograms per cubic meter. A meter stick by a meter stick by a meter stick of water weighs 2,200 pounds. 
it's a ton of water. And so um, that's why we're, but well, we're talking about big amounts of stuff. We're talking about swim pools. We're talking about um, hot air balloons. We're talking about large objects. We're talking about physics objects, not, you know, pouring little things back and forth into chemistry class. So a good lab that I would suggest for um, density is probably one that you can recreate in your class pretty straightforward. And that's having students determine the density of a liquid by measuring the mass of a liquid and the volume of the liquid and constructing a graph. One of the things that I will tell you after scoring um, the AP Physics 2 uh, experimental design question that I scored this year is students struggle with graphing by hand. And this is a great introduction activity that students could do and graph things by hand. And it's a pretty straightforward lab. Just take a graduate cylinder, sit it on some sort of triple beam balance or electronic balance, and just progressively pour more and more and more of a particular liquid, maybe be corn syrup, maybe be water, maybe be isopropyl alcohol, some liquid, and just pour progressively more and more of it into a graduate cylinder. And if I make just a really basic mass, uh, mass versus volume, the slope of that line should be the density. The wiser will run. Let's talk a little bit about graphing. One of the things that your kids need to be able to do is graph by hand. One of the things that your kids need to be able to do, and this isn't in the future, this is now, is be able to draw best fit lines with a ruler. I would always encourage you to have your students use a clear plastic ruler, not a wooden ruler. A clear plastic ruler, they can see the data points underneath the ruler. It's difficult to draw a best fit line when you can't see some of the data points because you cover them up with a wooden ruler. Well, this is a good example of, but it's a good way to practice, hopefully good data. <laughs> One of the nice things about this lab is because of its simplicity, you're gonna get good data. Questions about this, or perhaps you've done this lab before, some suggestions? Oh, Kathleen, good to see you. <laughs> I do think if you don't have graduate cylinders, that's something to invest in um, because your chemistry teacher is going to get annoyed with you borrowing them all the time if you've got a chemistry teacher. And um, I would encourage you when you do procure yourself some graduate cylinders is to procure yourself some wide mouth, some big wide mouth graduate cylinders because you're going to want to be dipping your hook objects, you know, your masses, your mat, you're going to want to be dipping them into a graduated cylinder. And if you've got yourself a narrow, you know, 100 milliliter graduate cylinder, it's not going to work very well. So get yourself some liter plastic graduate cylinders because you're going to use them a lot in the fluids unit. So just to give you kind of an example of the data that you possibly could get. You could get some mass values, you could get some volume values, and you could do a pretty good job of graphing that data and figuring out what the, the density of um, the liquid is. Density is a pretty straightforward <laughs> little um, unit 
a little portion of the unit. It shouldn't take much time. It should be something that kids are pretty familiar with. I would just really uh, emphasize that it's an intensive property, not an extensive property when you're talking with your students, because that's something that kids commonly get mixed up. If they have, they have more of it, the density changes. That's a common misconception that kids have. Let's look at some uh, past AP physics multiple choice questions about density. Are you ready? Okay, let's put this one. No, not this one. <laughs> My bad. This is the one I want to show you. Pardon me. Pardon me. I apologize. So this is one of those select two answers, by the way. So these reminder are the last five questions on the AP physics exams. It's questions uh, 131 through 135. Remember they switch from question 45 and then they switch to a different part of the stand term sheet for questions 131 through 135. If you don't mind, type it up in chat what you think the two correct answers are to this one. We got A and D. Another A and D, yeah. Lots of A and Ds. Even more A and Ds, okay. I agree with A. <laughs> um, D is going to be challenging because you don't know anything about the spring besides its length. And so that cube, you don't know what its mass is. And so you can't figure out what the spring constant of the spring is. So you can't use the spring as a measuring device. Does that make sense? What I'm saying there, y'all? It's not going to, you're not going to be able to figure out a force value from it. And so in this case, C is going to be able, is going to allow you to do that. Because it's going to allow you to be able to figure out some buoyancy values. Yeah, it's going to allow you to figure out some buoyancy values. Okay. okay. Switch over. Let's switch gears real quick and talk a little bit about the second of the three parts of our um, statics unit. And this first one is pressure. And for some reason, I can't believe I didn't, I don't have a slide for it. It's making me be super duper sad about this. But <clears throat> pressure is force over area. And I have a fabulous lab for you, which I boggles my mind. I don't have a slide about it. So I sincerely apologize about that. In AP physics, and basically in science, <laughs> the SI unit is a pascal. You also teach chemistry, y'all use kilopascals a lot. That's not the base unit, that's a prefixed version of the base unit, which is a pascal. A pascal is a minuscule amount of pressure. A pascal is a hundred grams spread out over a square meter. So if you think about your hook objects and you've got 100 grams, if you were to crumble up those 100 grams and spread them out over a meter stick by a meter stick, that is 
one pascal of pressure, which is very, very little pressure at all. Atmospheric pressure is 100,000 pascals, or a lot of times in chemistry, you'll, you'll say it's 101.3 kilopascals. That's STP, standard pressure. In AP physics, we're going to say atmospheric pressure is just 100,000 because it's darn close to 101.3 uh, kilopascals. 100,000 pascals is something kids are given on the equation sheet. And let me show you that real quick. So here's the current AP Physics 2 equation sheet. And if I scroll to the top and I look at the table of information, you'll notice that it gives you one atmosphere. As 100,000 Newtons per square meter, square meter or 100,000 Pascal, also one times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So this is a, a value that they give you in the equation sheet. The density of water is not a value they give you in the equation sheet. What's the amazing lab for pressure that you should do? It's the tire pressure lab. <clears throat> tire pressure lab involves meter sticks and tire pressure gauges. Just those two devices it involves meter sticks and tire pressure gauges, just those two devices. And using those two devices, you can figure out how much your student's car weighs. And let me explain how you do that. If I rearrange this equation, of force is equal to pressure times area. What I can do is I can measure the pressure individually in each of your students' four car tires. You can also measure the area of the tire that's touching the ground using a meter stick by measuring the length of the tire that's touching the ground and the width of the tire that's touching the ground. Once the student measures the pressure in individually in each of the four tires and multiplies it individually by the calculated area of the tire that's touching the ground, they can figure out the force on each of the four tires, which if they add them together, will give you the weight of the car. The unit for pressure that I would suggest you use just to make it a lot easier for yourselves is PSI. PSI is pounds per square inch. And then just have your students use the bad side of the meter stick, <laughs> the side that you taught them all year long not to use, <laughs> but the inches side, and then multiply it by square inches. An important thing that kids need to make sure they do is they need to make sure that they're measuring the actual part of the tire that's touching the ground, not the width of the tire or the length of the tire. So you're not seeing the writing that I'm putting on the board, on the, on the screen, Nicole. There's no writing showing up for y'all. Ashley, writing showing up? I see it. Okay. Yeah, Nicole, I will add this. Um, I'll add this to the, I'll have Matt put this in this in the um in the canvas site. You need to make sure that the kids are actually measuring the part of the tire that's touching the ground, which is because a lot of times if you're looking, you know, the, the tire goes like this and then it and then it's flat. Yeah. 
And then if you're looking straight onto the tire, the tire goes like this, and then it goes like this, and then it's flat. So you need to make sure it's just a part of the tire that's touching the ground. Safety instructions for this. Uh, do not let your kids turn their car on. I, I just don't. Don't let your kids turn their cars on. I don't even let my kids get in their cars because I don't want any sort of chance of them messing around near their tires and somebody's, and they turn the car on and it moves. Yeah. Another thing is that if you're doing this during lunch, I would encourage you not to do this during lunch. Um, if you have, because there's other people not paying attention driving around that it can become uh, not good. When the students calculate the weight, the weight they get is uh, much larger than the weight that the car should be. They get a much larger value, 25% more sometimes, 30% more, 40% more sometimes. How can you figure out how much a car weighs? A lot of times when you open up the door of a car, like if I'm holding the handle of a you guys see me, if I'm holding the handle of a, of a car door that I've opened up, right here on this metal part, there oftentimes is a sticker or a little metal plate that'll tell you what the weight of the car is in pounds. And the number that they calculate is oftentimes much larger than the value that that, um, information placard reads and kids will have lots of interesting ex reasons for why this is the case their main reason is they have a bunch of junk in their car but usually the weight's off by like a thousand pounds and unlike you have a thousand pounds of junk in your car and some will be like oh yeah, yeah, yeah i do and maybe it is if you've got somebody that's got a uh, pickup truck <laughs> they've got a thousand pounds of stuff in the back but the main reason that it's off is because of tread. Tread is the main reason it's off. Is because when kids measure the length and width of the tire that's touching the ground, they're assuming that all of that is touching the ground. And if there is, if a car tire is newer, not, I mean, you'll have some kids' tires that are, I don't even know how they're still not exploded because they're so bald. But if you have newer tires, especially if you've got kids that have got big old pickup trucks, uh, the tire tread can be significant. And so their value for the area is larger than the actual value for the area. And so they get a much larger weight of the car. Questions about this tire pressure lab? Once again, you just need meter sticks. Y'all got those. Just use the other side of the meter stick that's got inches on it. And chances are you're, you can just either buy a bunch of cheap tire pressure gauges. They're not expensive. Or just bribe your kids with five participation points to bring in the tire pressure gauge. And you're very glad they've got them. Questions about this lab? Just a reminder, I would just remind you about safety. Kids in parking lots and cars never, never are good. <laughs> The main focus of uh, the main part of the pressure um, portion of this unit is about fluid pressure and um, what factors affect the pressure of a fluid and more specifically, what factors affect the pressure of a liquid, yeah? So here's a simulation for y'all. And this is one that I'm gonna politely ask y'all to um, investigate in breakout rooms together. I'm going to give you the link to this one. 
Actually, let's go back one step. I'll put this in chat. And if you don't mind, go ahead and click on this link and click on the little play button here. And when you click on the play button, you're going to want to use the you run Cheer PJ browser compatible version. Don't download the Java version. I would just play this version. Basically, there's some legacy simulations that FET has that don't play well with don't play well with computers. And this is an example of it. And when you click on it, it's going to take a good minute to start to um to finally load up and when it does you're going to be able to investigate the factors that affect the pressure of of a liquid like what factors what are things that you can change that will affect the pressure and so when this finally does load up I want you to choose the pressure option. You notice there's some tabs up here. And I want you to choose the pressure tab, not the flow tab or the water tower tab. We're going to come back to those. I want you to choose the pressure tab. And the first thing I want you to do is you see right here, there's a little spout. And if you go like this, you can fill up this container of water. If you could give me a little thumbs up when this simulation is starting to run for y'all, it just takes a bit to it takes a bit to load up. When you do get it loaded up, make sure you fill up the water by you know using this little spout up here. Click on fluid density. Click on gravity. Gravity is a word that I hate um, because I really get frustrated. I emailed Fet written them letters <laughs> I'm an nerd bath. Uh, I don't like gravity because they're they're assigning a number to gravity and gravity doesn't have a number. Gravity is a phenomenon. And in this case, that number that they're giving there isn't even with the right units. <laughs> the units they should have there are newtons per kilogram because it's gravitational field strength not acceleration due to gravity. Those things are numerically equal to one another, but it's frustrating that they're using this general term for gravity and assigning a number to it. Because you could also talk about the universal law of gravitation. So there's lots of different gravity numbers. That's just like saying friction and having a number. Friction doesn't have a number. Friction is a phenomenon. There are coefficients of friction. There are forces of friction, but friction doesn't have a number. Same thing with gravity. So. I always point that out to my kids, everything's not perfect. So what I've got here is a pressure sensor. And this pressure sensor is gonna read out in kilopascals. Cuss. <laughs> and what I'd like y'all to investigate are what are some ways that when you take this pressure sensor and you put it underwater, that you can make that pressure sensor number change. What are ways that you can make that pressure sensor number change what ways can you make that pressure sensor number change and when you do change something how does it affect the pressure does it is it a linear increase if i double the number does it double the pressure if i double the number does it quadruple the pressure so what are the factors that i can change that will change that pressure reading and how does that pressure how does that factor affect the pressure? What things can I change that will change that pressure? And what and how does that factor affect the pressure? So I'm going to have you investigate it in your in some breakout groups. You make a list of the factors that affect the pressure and tell me how does that factor affect the pressure? So I'm going to put one more time in chat that um, simulation link. If I double that factor, if I double that independent variable, what does it do to the pressure? Does it double the pressure? Does it quadruple the pressure? Thumbs up on instructions, y'all. 
thumbs up on instructions. Okay. I'm going to put you all in the breakout room. So I'm crossing my fingers that somebody's got it up and running. <laughs> Uh, let's go with, uh, how many folks do we got? We've got 18. Let's do this. And I'm going to have you all come back at five after, if you don't mind. Or let's say, let's say seven after, maybe 10 minutes. <clears throat> One of the things I want to emphasize every time I show you a simulation is that I'm showing you a simulation for two reasons. One reason is that y'all in Alabama and I'm in Kansas. That's one reason. The other reason I'm showing you simulation is that I think simulations are great for setting up a hands-on lab experience. And so, uh, two, and then one third thing is that simulations allow you to change things that you can't change in real life. And in this case, it allows you to change two very important things that you can't change in real life, which is gravity, and more specifically, the gravitational field strength, as well as whether or not there's an atmosphere or not. One of the buttons you may not have noticed in the top right hand corner of the simulation is you can turn the atmosphere off, which makes it much more obvious what's happening when you change the, the three main factors that affect the pressure when something is when the, underneath the liquid. One that you noticed immediately was depth. When you change the depth, that's going to uh, increase. When you increase the depth, that's going to increase the pressure. When you increase the density of the liquid, it's gonna increase the pressure. And when you increase the gravitational field strength, you're gonna increase the pressure. And I think that having students investigate what factors affect pressure and investigate how those factors affect pressure are all really exciting um, things you can have the students do as far as data collection goes. Have them vary the depth because you can actually quantify the depth by clicking on this ruler and just slowly submerging this, this pressure sensor to increasing depths. And you can plot pressure versus depth. That's a great lab to do. Another one is to put the pressure sensor at one particular spot and vary the density and see how that affects the pressure. And the third one that's interesting to do is to change the gravitational field strength and see how that affects pressure. So those are three great, quick data collections and also graphing by hand practice that you can do. I like having students graph data from a simulation because it's good. Kids are awful at graphing data. Having students graph data that's bad just exacerbates the situation. And so if you have students graph data that's good, they get better practice at graphing. On the AP physics exam, we're never going to give students bad data. We're gonna give students good data. I have made literally dozens of data tables for the AP Physics 2 exam, and this is how we do it. We plug a number into an equation, we plug an independent variable value in, it spits out the dependent variable value, we make it a scotch bigger. We plug in another realistic value into an equation, we spit out the dependent variable, we make it a scotch smaller. A couple of them a bit, bit bigger, a couple of them a bit smaller, and so it always is a nice, it'll always give you a nice trend. It's not gonna be one wonky way out in left field sort of quantity because we have 140,000 exams to score and we just don't have time to fiddle with kids having wonky slopes. So I think simulations are a good idea with this one. So I think a great, a great graph is pressure versus depth and pressure versus density pressure versus depth, and pressure versus density. You'll notice that one that I did not list was pressure versus gravitational field strength. Pressure versus gravitational field strength is problematic. And the reason that pressure versus gravitational field strength is problematic is because as you change the gravitational field strength of this planet, it changes the atmospheric pressure. 
not just how hard the liquid is being pulled down towards the planet, it also changes how hard the atmosphere is being pulled down towards the planet. And you're going to get wonky results if you do so. So you can either get wonky results and ask your students to figure out whether or not they understand why the results are wonky, or you can just turn off the atmosphere and then your results are gonna be perfect. So let me kind of show you what I'm talking about there when I actually, when we actually look at the equation for Here's the pressure um, equation. So this is the equation here that you're gonna see on the equation sheet, this one right here. And it's P equals P naught plus rho GH. So what I would encourage you all to do is to graph pressure versus depth and pressure versus gravitational, uh, not gravitational, but sorry, I should say, uh, density. Pressure versus depth and pressure versus density. These are both great little labs to do real quick that will give you some good views of it being a, a nice straight diagonal line. What's also really nice is it'll give you a y-intercept. That both of these lines are gonna look like this. which is not something we see a lot of time when we're graphing data in physics. We oftentimes don't have y intercepts because oftentimes our x-axis is, you know, it doesn't work as well. And so this y-intercept obviously is your atmospheric pressure, which on the equation sheet is P naught. I don't know if something's wrong with the drawing, but we couldn't see the intercept. Okay, I apologize about that. Let me, let me change back to maybe red, maybe that'll help. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, just want to let you know. I appreciate that. So just to know that the y-intercept is the atmospheric pressure. The y-intercept is the atmospheric pressure. So P, these are some terms kids need to know for this part of the unit. P is absolute pressure, absolute, meaning the same as total. P naught is atmospheric pressure. Rho is the density of the fluid, the density of the liquid in this case. G is the gravitational field strength. I'm a very, very, very big fan of having different units for G, depending on when you're, how you're using them. If you're using G as acceleration due to gravity, meters per second faster every second when I drop something, meters per second slower every second when I throw it up in the air. But if I'm figuring how much something weighs, a much better unit to use is Newtons per kilogram, because Really what we're using there is gravitational field strength, not acceleration to the gravity. Those two values are numerically equal to one another because inertial mass and gravitational mass are equal. It also helps prepare kids for their second year of physics when we talk about electric field, Newtons per Coulomb. Rho GH is what's called gauge pressure, gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is how much pressure is coming just from the fluid, in this case, the liquid. The problem with varying the gravitational field strength when you have the atmosphere on is that it affects the G of the atmosphere because really it's this equation is rho GH plus rho GH. It's rho GH plus rho GH. And one of the rho GH is the atmosphere and the other rho GH is the liquid. And when you change the gravitational field strength, 
it changes the gravitational field to impact on the atmosphere, but it also changes the density of the atmosphere. <laughs> and so it gets super wonky. The last thing I'd mention to you is that um, kids don't have much sense of how strong or atmospheric pressure is. They don't have much sense of it. In order to experience, in order to double the pressure they feel, they would have to go 33 feet underwater in order to double the pressure that they feel. They'd have to go 10 meters deep underwater because that would give you a gauge pressure of 100,000 pascals. And kids have not been 33 feet underwater unless you've got some kids that scuba dive. Kids have been 12 feet underwater, maybe in the deep end of a swimming pool but they've probably not been 33 feet underwater. And even 12 feet underwater gives you a significant amount of pressure in the ooze. 33 feet underwater is significant. Atmospheric pressure also is 14 pounds per square inch. Right now there's 14 pounds. That's like a 15 pound dumbbell pressing on every square inch of y'all of our body, pressing inwards. There's 14 pounds of force pressing inwards on every square inch of our body, it's just our bodies pressing outwards that equally equally hard. Hands-on lab version of this. Hands-on lab version of this. Let's do this real quick. Let's go back to this. So there's a hands-on lab version of this lab that's really great, and it's this right here. I know I I don't I don't like showing probe wear labs because probes are expensive. But my bet is that if your school has AP chemistry and you have probes that your AP chemistry teacher has a gas pressure sensor. And you can use a gas pressure sensor to measure liquid pressure. So this is the three pieces of equipment that you need. You need a graduated cylinder filled with water. You need a ruler or a meter six works fine too. And a gas pressure sensor. Now let me zoom in a little bit on this gas pressure sensor. I realize I got these things way smaller than I wanted to have. So what you see here is what equipment comes with a gas pressure sensor. And specifically the equipment that comes with a gas pressure sensor that you're gonna to wanna to use is the tube. What you do is you attach this tube to this part of the gas pressure sensor. And you get this long tube coming off the gas pressure sensor. And the gas pressure sensor should be measuring atmospheric pressure. You fill your graduate cylinder up with water. Put your, meter, put your meter sticker ruler right up next to the graduate cylinder and you just dip the, the pressure sensor, the tip of the tube, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper underwater. And what that does is it'll compress the gas inside of the tubing and increase the gas pressure in the tubing because the water is going to compress the gas inside the tube. And you're just going to do the pressure versus depth lab. And you're just gonna measure the depth from using your ruler. The graduate cylinder is not gonna measure, it's not gonna give you depth, but the ruler is gonna give you depth. I bet your AP chemistry teacher has this equipment because they can do every gas ball with this equipment. And so I bet they have it. Questions about this lab? You can change density, but at your own peril. <laughs> and what I mean at your own peril is uh, perhaps if you're the AP chemistry teacher, you don't mind what happens to those tubes 
but I promise you, your AP chemistry tutors are not going to love it if you dipped those tubes in honey because it's never coming off or something else that's incredibly viscous. I just use one. What's neat is once again, this is going to give you a, a Y intercept. And the slope is going to be what? What's the slope going to be equal to, y'all? It'll be density times gravity. Rho G. Yeah, exactly right. X, yeah, rho G, exactly right. Yeah, and, and one of the nice things about the things, the equipment that I'm showing you is that you got a couple of years to get it. And that's another one of the nice things about fluids not starting next year is that one thing that I'm, what I would suggest, a suggestion that I have for y'all, I realize I didn't make it at the beginning of the workshop, is that if you have um, some time after the exam this coming year, teach the kids fluids because that'll help you get familiar with the unit. Not because the kids need it for the exam, but because you know if you've got yourself one or two times teaching fluids before it counts, quote unquote, then you get, you're gonna have a little bit of an opportunity to um, get more familiar with it. So let me show you two quick examples of, of problems that would be AP physics level problems involving absolute pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure. Previously in the problem, this is part C of a problem. Previously in the problem, it gave you what the density of water was. It told you that it was a that told you that it was a thousand. So basically they're just asking you to calculate P at point A. So you just plug in atmospheric pressure. That's on the equation sheet under the table of information. Rho is the density of water. They give you that in the problem. G is G. And H in this case looks to be six meters because you've got that five meters here and the one meter to the top of the two. So it's a relatively straightforward problem. Um, I will tell you that that parentheses part is not going to be there when, we, when you, you guys teach it. And the reason it's there now is because in the physics two course and exam description, the word absolute and gauge aren't there. They are in the draft curriculum framework that words absolute engage are there so kids need to know the two different terms. Let's do just a little bit more if you don't mind. <clears throat> um, actually, let's not. <laughs> Let's do a quick, if you don't mind, I've got 27 after. Let's go into, let's say 32 after, if you don't mind. We'll do a quick five minute little get up, walk around, use the facilities, me too, um, break. So 32 after, does that work for everybody? Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot, friends. Let, not, I'll throw my camera off just for a second, too. <laughs>
So I've got 32 after, so I'll uh, start back up again. <clears throat> I'll talk just a little bit about this website before we get going. Um, there are two other simulation sites besides FET that I go back to again and again and again. And one of them is this one right here. It's called O Physics. And O Physics has lots of great simulations for, for physics, as well as another one called the Physics Aviary. And we'll look at some physics aviary simulations as well. But this one here is um, one that we're going to utilize next. And just to show you how to navigate, because sometimes it's a little bit kind of uh, interesting how to get there. If you click on the link in chat, the way you navigate to simulations is you hover over the whatever topic or unit you're looking at, and then you click on that. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. It's not a list of or anything. So if you hover over fluids and then click on buoyancy, it's going to pull up the simulation. And I'll put that in chat as well. Now, one thing you'll notice that you can control at the bottom of the simulation is fluid viscosity. We're not going to worry about fluids being uh, viscous in AP Physics 1, unless we're talking about it from the perspective of a Newton's law question and it's uh, applying some sort of drag force. But in fluids, we're not going to consider um, fluids having viscosity. They just freely flow all willy-nilly. There's no effective viscosity on the inside of a tube or, or things like that. So if I have a fluid flowing through a tube, I'm not concerned about what the fluid is. It's not gonna, it's touching the inside of the, of the tube doesn't make a difference. So what I'd like you to do is, uh, kind of play around with the object density up here and the fluid density and see if you can make some observations. I like to do this with, with kids because if they kind of fiddle around with these numbers, they can find some really interesting relationships between the object density and the fluid density. Matt's turned on our share screen. And so if you don't mind, I'm gonna give you uh, six or seven minutes in breakout room again with your um, friends to investigate how does changing the fluid density affect things and how does changing the object density affect things. Uh, we're gonna talk about buoyancy, which is Archimedes principle. And buoyancy is, from Archimedes perspective, depends on the weight of the fluid displaced. That Archimedes tells us that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, the weight of the liquid displaced. But it's important for us to talk with our students that about found that fundamentally that the buoyant force is a result of differences in pressure. That when you have something that's underwater or it's moving water out of the way, that there's a difference in pressure. And you can use rho GH in order to derive the equation for buoyancy. So the equation for buoyancy is rho g v. And let's talk about those three different symbols real quick. Rho, and let's talk about something floating in water to make it easier for ourselves as far as symbols go. Rho is the density of water. G is gravitational field strength and v is the volume of the water displaced, moved out of the way. That's Archimedes principle. It's the buoyant force, the force that acts on something that's moved a fluid out of the way. There is a buoyant force acting on all of us right now. When you stand on a bathroom scale, that bathroom scale does not tell you how much you actually weigh. It tells you a very small amount less, like a fraction of a pound. Don't get concerned, <laughs> a whole pound, a fraction of a pound. But interestingly enough, the more air you displace, the bigger that difference is. You know? The more air you displace, the bigger the, the buoyant force. But you can get this equation from the pressure equation.
and this version of the pressure equation. Because foundationally, a buoyant force is a result of a difference in pressure. That when something is moving water out of the way, the bottom part of that object is deeper than the top part. Since it's deeper, it's got more pressure it's experiencing on the bottom. So if I were to draw a picture of a container, and I would have a block like this, I can figure out the buoyant force acting on that block by calculating the difference in pressure from the top of the block and the bottom of the block. One of the things that's a challenging thing for kids to visualize is that if this is my block, let's, let's use a different color to emphasize it, it'll be red. That the water molecules that are right below the block, those water molecules are jiggling and all, they're, just, they're doing this kind of dig. And then periodically they go boop and they push up on the object, yeah? And the water molecules that are on top of the object are also jiggling and periodically they go boop and push down on the object. That's really difficult for kids to, to think about in their head that the water molecules that are below the object, that's the hard one. The water molecules that are below the object are jiggling because they have some temperature, right? They're jiggling and periodically they go boop and push up on the object. And it's the difference in the push down and the push up that is the buoyant force. It's the difference between the push down and the push up that's the buoyant force. So if I were to talk about the, the push down and the push up, if I were to write equations for those, it would give me my buoyant force equation. And I think this is useful to do with kids, especially because it's probably gonna be April that you do it. So hopefully by that point in time, they're used to you getting up on the board and doing the derived sort of thing, yeah. So if I talk about the pressure on top, let, and let's, we know that the, there's atmospheric pressure at the top and the bottom, so we'll just disregard that. That the pressure on top is rho GH, and the force on top is rho GH times A, yeah? So that if this force acting down on the object is rho GH times A. And the H in this case is this H here. And the rho is the density of the liquid. And the pressure pressing up on the bottom is rho G big H times A. And let's say that I've got a nice, some sort of rectangular solid. So <laughs> it just makes it nice and the air in the top is the same as the air in the bottom. So my buoyant force is rho G H A minus rho G H A. And what's that H? The H is from here the big H is from there down at the bottom. And this is all showing up for y'all, right? Because I'm doing this on, I'm doing this on notability, so I sure hope it starts showing up. And what's the difference between big H and little h? The height of the block or the-, the Yeah, absolutely right, Kate. The height of the block, the height of whatever the thing is, right? And if I take the height of that block multiplied by the area of the block, I get the volume of the block. And so my buoyant force is the density of the water times G times the height of the block times the area of the block, which is the volume of the block. Did this derivation make sense, y'all? Yeah. This is the foundational 
the foundational thing that causes the buoyant force. But also, if you look at this equation, rho g v, it's also the weight of the water moved out of the way. That rho g v is also the weight of the water moved out of the way. And I'll show you that real quick as well. So if I say that the buoyant force is rho v g, well, rho v, if rho is mass over volume, then mass is density times volume. That's the weight of the water moved out of the way. That's what Archimedes says. Archimedes says it's the weight of the water moved out of the way. But foundationally, it's the difference in pressure. And you can find this derivation in every textbook. Both of th these derivations are in every textbook. An important thing to also mention to your students is that <clears throat> sometimes kids, when they draw free body diagrams for objects, like to have like to have all of the arrows, like this molecule, this molecule, this molecule. The buoyant force is a a total. The buoyant force is a total. The buoyant force is a total of all the pushes acting on that object from the liquid. Because one of the things you may have realized that we disregarded were all the pushes sideways. That as I go down, the push is more and more and more and more and more, more on the side of the block, but it's the same push on the side of the blocks. And so you don't have, you know, there's no horizontal buoyant force, just a vertical buoyant force. And I really should probably do a better job of having like a bigger long arrow. <laughs> Now, what happens to the buoyant force as you go deeper underwater? If I've got something like a block of wood and I push that block of wood deeper and deeper and deeper underwater, what happens to the buoyant force acting on the water? I'm sorry, buoyant force acting on the block of wood. If I have a block of wood that I push deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper underwater. What happens to the buoyant force as I take a Block of wood, like legit, non-compressible, non-balsa woody wood that I push deeper and deeper underwater. What happens to the buoyant force? Doesn't change. It doesn't change. And the reason it doesn't change is because as the block goes deeper, both of these pressures increase proportionally. Yeah? Like the equation that I derived I didn't tell you how much the H's were. <laughs> if I make one of the H's bigger, if I make little h bigger, I also make big H equally bigger. And so the difference between big H and little h is always the same. But that's true only once it is completely submerged. Uh, that's, uh, Jennifer, that is a really great point. Yeah, that's a really great point. And so, and I was going off of the picture where the thing is, is, is submerged. You're exactly correct, Jennifer. That's a really great point. Is there a good lab that we can do with buoyant force? Absolutely, there's a good lab we can do with buoyant force. And here is kind of a picture of the setup that you would need in order to get this to work. Share your screen, share the screen. Am I sharing the screen yet? Are you sharing, are you seeing it this slide? Okay. We can see it. Excellent, I sure appreciate that. So this is a good example of the setup that you'd have to have. And I, I just found this picture on Vernier's website. You don't need to use a force probe. You could just use a spring scale. An analog spring scale works totally fine. And you're never gonna have it be that deep underwater either. What you're gonna wanna do is take your spring scale and hold your object and then just slowly dip the object deeper and deeper and deeper underwater. And 
plot a force. Uh, depends on what you want to do. <laughs> You've got some options here. One option is to plot the spring scale reading versus the volume, the change in volume, like, or the volume displaced. Is this showing up, y'all, the writing I'm doing? Oh, thank goodness. Now, you've got two options here. You've got a, a more complex option or an easier option. The easier option is to plot just the buoyant force on the y-axis. And that would involve your students taking the original value and subtracting the new value every time they dip it further and further and further in. Because that will give you a straight diagonal line with the y-intercept at zero. The more complex option is to plot the spring scale reading. And if you plot the spring scale reading, you're going to have a graph that looks like this. Because you're going to start with whatever the actual weight of the object is, and then that value is going to get less and less and less and less and less and less. What's the graph supposed to look like? Uh, it, uh, not showing up. I apologize. It should be a it should be a y intercept uh, that is a negative slope. Okay. Because as you dip that object deeper and deeper underwater, the spring scale is going to read a smaller and smaller value. Othor, I don't know if you changed colors, but I can see red. So I can see the axis and the labels, but I can't see any graph that you've drawn on. Yeah, I, I, and I did red again. It just did, must not have worked. I apologize about that. Sometimes, sometimes I have great luck. Sometimes I don't have great luck. It's just a, it's just a negatively sloped line, straight line with a line or set. Y intercept should just be the weight of the thing out or the object not touching the water. Or yes, absolutely okay. right. The actual weight versus what 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 it will be reading is the apparent weight as you get it further and further in. Now you'll see this picture that looks like they've got like a regular old hook object. See if you can find something taller and something taller, because <laughs> that works a little bit better. Yeah, so you could have, like, if you had six lab groups, you could have them with different objects or, or different weighted objects and then different fluids, possibly. You, if could, you, were... you could do different, yep. Okay, absolutely. You could do different fluids as well because the different okay. fluids are going to make a difference. Um, so what are some, what are some non-sticky sort of different density fluids? I mean, salt water would be okay, but that's not super different. It's not super different. Isopropyl alcohol is an option. That's going to be a little bit different. Isopropyl alcohol will be. Um, but what you can do, and what I've done is, I've just, I've just decided that these are some equipment that I'm going to use that are going to get sticky, and I just use those. Like these objects are going to get sticky. Label it, them, especially yeah. if I have my, if I have my own graduate cylinders. Um, I usually, I we have a dishwasher at my school, um, that gets gets the honey out pretty well um i usually use not honey but uh, um corn syrup it's, it would take a decent yeah. amount but you could probably use ditch detergent like dawn you, yeah that would work too as well jennifer that'd be another good option the the, the most problematic thing about this is the sticking of the object at the side of the wall on the inside of the graduate cylinder. That's the biggest issue, is that the object will stick to the inside wall of the graduate cylinder and then you're just you're just toast. You gotta like unstick it and it's a whole that's the reason wide mouth graduate cylinders work pretty good. So if you can get yourself a leader graduate cylinder that's pretty wide mouth, then you don't have the they don't have the issue of it hitting the side of the inside of the container and having, um, uh, what is it? Adhesion or cohesion, I forget. <laughs> Which one is it, friends? Both, kind of, right? Water and water sticking together, but then also, yeah.
<clears throat> I teach fluids as my first student in physics too. And this, this is what I do with my students the very first day of class um, is I cut up a six inch by six inch piece of aluminum foil and give it to every student. And I have them make a boat. And the task is to fold that piece of six inch by six inch piece of aluminum foil into a boat that will hold as many metal washers as possible. And so what I just simply do is I just rip off one uh, foot pieces of aluminum foil with a ruler and I just cut it into four pieces and I give each kid a six inch by six inch piece of aluminum foil. You could give them a foot by a foot, but it, that's a, it'll hold a lot <laughs> of washers. Um, I know that some folks will see that this done with pennies, um, but uh, be prepared to sit there and watch for a long, long, long time as kids individually put one penny at a time. I'm talking about some pretty large diameter washers. Um, ones that are, you know, like two or three inches in diameter. Um, because you don't want it to last forever. <laughs> because even then I can get my students to put 20 or 30 washers and they're doing them one at a time, which is a reason that I suggest we have buckets of water. What's nice is you don't need big buckets. You don't need five gallon buckets. You just need a little tiny buckets, you know, little tiny buckets like this because it's six inches by six, six inch by six inch. So once they fold it, it'll be small enough that it'll fit into just a regular little tiny bucket. And I just have those buckets around the room. And then, you know, kids uh, cheering or giggling at people making not super successful boats. Which of these designs is the best? The one that doesn't look like a boat is the best. <laughs> Anytime you have students fold it into a boat, it's just disastrous because it just, it just flips over. The best is a square where they've just carefully folded up the sides just a, just a little bit, not very much. They don't have to do it very much. They just need a, it just, a square is the best um, shape or even a rectangular solid, I should say, not very tall as in comparison to the width. And I'll let them do one at a time. They place one washer at a time and they'll just, they'll, it's also neat because then you're talking about pressure as well, right? That you don't want to just stack all your washers in one spot because what will happen is the aluminum foil will just collapse. And that's always fun to uh, uh, laugh along with the kid. <laughs> And I would also suggest not heavy duty aluminum foil, just regular duty aluminum foil, because heavy duty aluminum foil will hold a ton of pressures. I made that mistake. Don't get regular aluminum foil. Let's get whatever your grocery store's grocery store cheap aluminum foil is. And I promise you a roll will last you for years. And if you have a big enough class, you could do groups of two if you want to as well. But I find kids are not excited about sharing this activity. One last thing before we move on is that encourage your students to practice with a piece of paper, whatever they're gonna do. Because as soon as you fold a piece of aluminum foil, you can't ever unfold it. Once you get a crease in a piece of aluminum foil, that crease is disastrous because it's just gonna, it's gonna buckle at that point. One of my favorite resources are what are called next time questions. Next time questions are a resource that you surely have somewhere in your classroom because surely at some point in time, your school utilized the conceptual physics Hewitt textbook. And so this is an example of, uh, I've got three next time questions right in a row about fluids to show you, and not fluids, buoyancy to show you before we move on to dynamics.
You can find these next time questions on the Arbor Scientific site. You notice down here in the bottom left hand corner, it says Arbor Scientific. If you just Google next time question, you'll it'll next time question physics, it'll be the first link. There's oh, hundreds of them. And they're all two slide, two page slide PDFs. The first with the question, the second with the answer. I'll go through these pretty quick because we're, we're past 11. The answer to this question is that it's going to be the same amount submerged, that being on a different, being on the moon isn't going to make a difference. And the reason being on the moon isn't going to make a difference is that the two forces acting on this object are the force of gravity and the buoyant force. And since it's floating, those two forces are equal in magnitude. So the force of gravity is equal to the buoyant force. I'm not sure why I'm writing anymore. Is it showing up for y'all? Okay. So if 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 I um I know what I'll do, I'll just switch over. I've got them, I've got them as um a notability. It just there showed up. There's a lag. Oh, oh, did it? There's a lag. Oh goodness gracious. That's making me more annoyed. I'm just gonna share my I'm just gonna share notability because I know that I've I appreciate with y'all's patience. So the buoyant force is equal to the force of gravity. Yeah. And the, the weight of the ice cube is mg, and the buoyant force is rho vg. And so my g's go bye bye. And so the g doesn't make a difference. And so even on the moon, it's going to have 90% of it submerged. There's just two forces acting on the buoyant force up and the force of gravity down. And buoyant force symbol is capital F with a lowercase b. It's important to use a lowercase b and not a capital B because F with the capital B, it won't make a difference in this one, but just for the future. A capital B is the uh, subscript for the magnetic force. Remember back from your E and M days. So lowercase b is buoyant, uppercase b, it's not gonna make a difference in physics. If I can put capital B there, it's still gonna take it. It's fine. But you don't take it in physics too. <laughs> Kids do lowercase b or capital B will pick you. Here's another one. Sorry, my, I didn't realize my dog was underneath me and I uh, woke her up and she told me I woke her up and she was displeased by being woken up. Um, this, is a, this is a neat relationship. Um, and I always show my students the, the moon one before this one, because if you show the students this one, then the moon one, the moon answer is more obvious and I'll show you why. So in this case, the density of the block of wood is more than half the density of water. And I'll show you why that's the case with a derivation. Once again, mg, the force of gravity, is equal to the buoyant force. The force of gravity is the mass of the block times g, which is equal to the density of water times the volume of water displaced times g. So my G's go away. And the mass of the block is equal to the density of the block times the volume of the whole block, right? 
So the mass of the block is equal to the density of the block times the volume of the whole block. And so I can write it as the density of the block times the volume of the block is equal to the density of water times the volume of water. And what this allows me to do is to get a ratio of densities to the ratio of the volumes. And specifically what I'm gonna get is the density of the block over the density of water, because the density of water is gonna be less, is equal to the volume of water moved out of the way divided by the volume of the whole block. So the volume of the water moved out of the way is the volume of the block that's submerged. The volume of the block is the volume of the whole block. That's equal to the ratio of the densities. That the density of the block in this case is less than the density of water because it's floating. And so the ratio of the densities is equal to the ratio of the volumes. Did this make sense to all what I'm doing here? Yeah. I realize I'm doing a lot of, go for it, Meredith. Um, would you recommend waiting to teach specific gravity until you do buoyancy? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, specific gravity is um, not an assessed topic on the AP physics exams. So teach it or not teach it. Um, I usually, because um, uh, specific gravity is just the ratio of that gravity to, to, the, gra to the density of water, right? And mm -hmm. so um, it's, it's an interesting thing to talk with students about from the perspective of um, a lot of times specific gravity is listed in like oil density. So that's interesting to a lot of students. And so I don't teach density until I get to, I won't teach density until I get to fluids because there, I won't need density beforehand. Not that I can, not that I can make up in physics one. I mean, I won't explicitly do a bunch of labs with it until I get the fluids. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Meredith, I appreciate it. Okay, one last one. And this is my favorite next time question of them all. And hope that I don't have the answer shown. Here we I just tell my students that balsa wood like styrofoam and no styrofoam. I mentioned that one of the FRQs that I scored this year at the AP Physics reading was the moons and planet problem. And the moons and planet problem for AP Physics 1 was a quantitative, sorry again, qualitative, quantitative translation question. We asked the students to talk to us about, in words, the net force acting on both the moons. Then we asked them to derive an equation for the net force acting on both moons. And then we said, did your equation match the words you said? So we asked them to say things in words. How is it possible that, um, oh, excellent, Ashley. Um, 
uh, we asked the students to say, is it possible for moon A to have a larger net force? Is it possible for moon B to have a larger net force? And then we asked them to write equations. And we said, do your equations match what you said in words? And the one thing I'll tell you about, the two things I'll tell you about qualitative quantitative translation questions is that um, it, it should never be a situation where their equations don't match their words. If their equations don't match their words, then they made a boo-boo, <laughs> right? Because if their equations don't match their words, then they've got bad physics somewhere because their words should be good physics and their equations should be good physics. The other thing I'd mention to you is that sometimes kids see it in their noggins, not in the same order that they get asked to do it. It may be that the kids see it better with the quantitative first than the qualitative. But one thing that um, my wife does research on testing is that kids don't skip parts. They just, they just plow through it. Statistically speaking, kids plow through problems. They don't skip parts, even as much as we tell them not to. And, but this is a type of problem that we should tell our students to, if you don't get it with this first part, don't write gobbledygook. Because I'm sure um, Ashley can agree with me that kids wrote gobbledygook, then they wrote maybe a good equation, and they're like, like, nope, <laughs> those don't match. <laughs> I should have because we asked you to talk to us about this. It was it was unreal to be honest. <laughs> yeah, they didn't match a lot of the time. Yeah, and, and actually, the worst part was when you they would draw normal forces on moons. There's like a normal force acting on a moon. Like, yeah. serious? <laughs> what what yeah. table is that moon resting on? <laughs> yes, I just um, quit. I just quit dreaming about this problem, so now it's back <laughs> in my mind. Sorry, Ashley, I got some PTSD there for you from that. From it's problem. okay. Actually, it was my first time reading and I enjoyed it. And someone said that was horrible. You know, another friend of mine who was grading something else. And uh, I said, well, hey, maybe I got the worst situation the first time. So, yeah, better. you know, and, and Ashley and Ashley, usually the first time is the one that feels the worst just because you have to get used to the eight to five. Once you get that, it's the other stuff that's the fun part about the reading. The reason well, I bring up. I'm a nerd, I loved it. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons to bring up qualitative quantitative translation questions is that if I asked you something quantitatively, to do something quantitatively, it would help you answer this question. So let me help you with the, with the question. Draw for me a free body diagram for the rock block system. Draw a free body diagram for the rock block system. Not for the rock, not for the block, for the rock block system. What does a free body diagram look like for the rock block system? What's the free body diagram look like for the rock block system? Actually, there was another Alabama person that was at the reading too, and another person from A plus that was there that said hello to me, and I can't remember her name now. I'm super embarrassed that I can't remember. It was her first year too, I think. Maybe her second. Year. Uh... I don't, I, I'm, it was funny because at the very end, I lost, I met uh, in Birmingham, two of the, the two private school teachers there. So, and every time I went to go talk to you, there was a ton of people around you because you're so popular, <laughs> right? <laughs> Goodness gracious, Sasha, that, that, that's, that, that makes me blush, I apologize. But it was um, really great. Um, I can't think of, I met maybe four people from Alabama, so. Okay. If there aren't very many, usually the, you know, it's usually the uh, population of the state. There aren't very many people from Kansas either. This is the free body diagram, right, folks? Buoyant force up, force of gravity down for the system, correct? And they're equal to one another because it's floating. What's the free body diagram look like when I flip it upside down? Same. And so since it is the same, the buoyant force is the same. And since the buoyant force is the same, the weight of water moved out of the way is the same. And if the weight of water moved out of the way is the same, then we know that the answer to the second question is remain unchanged. And, but when we flip it, the first thing that moves water out of the way is the rock. So not all, not as much, I should say, of the block needs to get moved out of the way so less than half of the block is moved out of the way. What becomes problematic is if you start thinking about the rock or the block 
as separate entities, then it becomes more challenging. We've gone through three of the four topics. We've got one more topic left, and it has two parts, and they're both conservation laws. And they both have to deal with water flowing through pipes. They both have to do with water flowing through pipes. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit to fluid dynamics. The slide deck that I've uh, shared with y'all and that Matt put in Canvas, is that right, sir? Canvas, is that right? Or maybe there's a link. You got a yes, link. Yes, sir. Well, I'll put it in Canvas. Okay. It's linked on the main page, and okay, uh, I'll also link it in the chat. Perfect. Um, there are. I'm on like slide 62, and I surely haven't shown you 63 slides. So there's a ton of examples. I always like to have more time, more stuff <laughs> than I have time allotted for, because I was always so worried about <laughs> that stuff. So um, I'm going to switch what I'm sharing with y'all. I'm going to reshare it just to make sure everybody has access to it. Thank you so much, Matt. I sure appreciate that. That's super nice of you. Okay. So the fourth topic in the four topics, the first topic is density. Next topic is pressure. Next topic is um, the buoyant force. And the fourth topic is conservation laws and conservation laws of our, what fluid dynamics is all about. And there are two conservation laws that we have to talk about when we talk about um, fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics is the study of fluids in motion. And for us, we're concerned more about water flowing through pipes. And the reason water flowing through pipes and not say, for example, gas flowing through pipes is that we run into the issue that gas is compressible. So we want gas not to be compressible and make it a little bit easier for ourselves. This is also something that people that are involved in HVAC, sorry to bring that up, Matt, people that are involved in HVAC are concerned about because they're concerned about gases flowing through duct work, right? So that's another thing. That's one thing I really like about fluids is because there are lots of jobs that folks can get, can make more money than we make because Matt's waiting for one of them. <laughs> They're gonna charge more money than, than we make to come fix his HVAC. And it has a lot to do with fluids, right? And thermodynamics, obviously, correct? That'd be another physics two topic. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <clears throat> so there's two conservation laws. One conservation law is um, the thumb over the end of a water hose, thumb over the end of a water hose law. So if I have a water hose and I forgot my, you know, whatever that thing's called, what do you call that thing? You know, you're screwed on the end nozzle? of a water hose. Uh, nozzle, yeah, a nozzle, a little squeeze handle nozzle. You forget that and you're lazy to go find it in the garage and all you got is a hose and you're trying to water something far away. You can just cover over the end of the hose and it'll squirt out fast. Yeah. That's something called the continuity equation. And that's conservation of mass, that the amount of mass that flows by a particular spot per second is constant. But since we talk about liquids, we can say also the amount of volume that flows past a particular spot per second is constant. And the other equation is a conservation of energy equation that when I'm holding that tube, that not tube, <laughs> that uh, water hose, that there's difference in pressure because that water's going vertically upwards. Like I'm not going to be holding it right on the ground. And not only that, but the water's coming from below ground. So there has to be difference, differences in pressure in order to change the water's gravitational potential energy. In order to change the water's gravitational potential energy and not change its kinetic energy, I have to have differences in pressure in order for work to be done in order to move the water vertically upwards. So I've got two equations. One equation is that 
is that the uh, um, amount of water, amount of volume of water that flows past a spot every second in a tube is constant, no matter the diameter of the tube. Another good example of this is um, uh, that we'll talk about when we get to the Bermudas is uh, arteries, <laughs> blood vessels, narrowing of blood vessels is another good um, example to give students. In Bernoulli's is if I'm changing the height of a tube, then I'm changing its gravitational potential energy, which means I have to do work on it, which means I have to have some way of having a force difference, and that's a pressure difference. I want to look at this simulation first. This is another O physics simulation. This is another O physics simulation. I want to give you all just a little bit of time to investigate this simulation. So let me put in chat this link here. Once again, this is on O physics and it's the fluid dynamics and Bernoulli equation simulation. I also have a lab for this one. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put the um, height one, the same as height two. So you notice that there are some sliders at the bottom. There are some sliders at the bottom. And one of the sliders is H1 and the other slider is H2. So I can move this vertically up and down, yeah? But I want them to be at the same height because I'm not interested in quite yet in there being a vertical height change. And what I'd like you to do is vary R1 and R2 and see what happens as you vary R1 and R2. And what you wanna be looking for when you do that is how fast those little arrows are moving, but also click up here on this radio button that says so, show pressure and velocity values. So look at the velocity values. The velocity one in this case is three, and this velocity here is one and a half. And look at the relationship between the radiuses, one and two, and the velocity one down here, and the velocity two up here. So have it be at the same height. Don't have there be a height difference. Just have them be at the same height. Not a height difference, but have them be at the same height. And vary the radii and see how it affects the speed. And I'm going to not throw any breakout rooms. Just give you a second to fiddle with that.
this is something called the continuity equation. It's conservation of mass. But since it's a liquid, it's incompressible. So we can also look at it from the perspective of conservation of volume. It's called the continuity equation. And the way that I can get this relationship is I can talk about a, 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 a certain amount of water. And if I have a certain amount of water, let's say this bit of water right here. And this certain about certain bit of water is going to travel from over here to over here. It's going to move a particular distance past a spot. And it's particularly going to travel a distance of whatever the, the length of that bit is. Yeah. Or the length of that bit is. It's going to travel that in a certain amount of time. On the right side of it, that same amount of water has to pass a particular spot in the same amount of time. That same amount of water has to protect pass a particular sp uh, spot on the tube in the same amount of time. So that same wedge isn't gonna be as wide in this case. It's gonna be less wide. So maybe this over here is like a big L and this is a little L but it passes a particular spot in the thick part of the tube in the same amount of time. So the same amount of water has to pass a, pass a particular spot in the same amount of time, the same amount of water, the same volume of water, the same volume of water passes a point in the narrow part of the pipe in T seconds, that same volume of water has to pass the, a, a different point in the wide pipe in the same amount of time t. So the same volume, this volume has to pass a particular point in a certain amount of time. On the left side, it's got to be the same amount of volume and the same amount of time. Otherwise, there were the it, if it didn't happen, the, the tube would get stretched or there'd be some issue with that. So we're talking about a tube that can't get bigger. That's conservation of mass. The amount of mass that stuff passes here in a second has to be equal to the amount of mass that passes here in a second. Since it's incompressible, the amount of volume that passes here in a second is the same as the amount of volume that passes here in a second. Those volumes are the width of the bit multiplied by the cross-sectional area. So this cross-sectional area here is a little a, and this cross-sectional area over here is a big A. So the equation that I'm eventually gonna get is that a big L times a little a over T is equal to a little L times big A over T. Did I do that wrong? I know I did that right. And I've got a distance divided by time and a distance divided by time is a speed. And so a, a little area, which we'll oftentimes call, or the first area we call area one, multiplied by velocity or speed one is equal to area two times velocity two or speed two. This is what's referred to as the continuity equation. And this is one of the equations in the equation sheet. And it all has to do with those, these by the way are speed, not volume. The, the volume of water that passes a particular point in T seconds has to pass another point later on in the travels in the same amount of time, that same volume of water, but it goes to different speeds. So if I look back at my numbers up here, And specifically, if I draw your attention to R and R, it's hard to see, but you see that this is 
R is 0.5 meters and R is one meter. So the radius is double. And the speed has gone from uh, four to one. Because when the radius doubles, and this is the tricky part about this question, this, this topic is that the cross-sectional area quadruples. And since the uh, cross-sectional area quadruples, the speed of the liquid is cut in a four. And of course, what we'll give them as options is if we cut, if we double the radius, we cut the speed in half. That will for sure be an option that we give students, right? Well, so we're not going to give them the cross sectional area, we're going to give them the radius. We're going to say the radius doubles what happens to the speed. And the first choice will be that the, the, the um, speed gets cut in half, the rate gets cut in four. Does that make sense what I'm saying, folks? Does that, that, tr that trick, does that tricky question make sense? And the reason for it is because otherwise it's too basic. Like there has to be some challenge to it beyond just if this thing gets twice as much, this thing gets half as much. But I always remind my students about covering over the end of the uh, garden hose. If I decrease the area, the water is going to squirt out faster. Most kids have done that. I have a lab for this, and I try to find a good picture of it. And the one I found is, uh, <laughs> these kids are too cute. So let me show you this real quick. <laughs> you guys see the picture of the kids with the uh, water guns? So I use these water guns to basically confirm the continuity equation. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that I can do A1 V1 equals A2 V2. And the A1 is the area of the big part of the tube. Does that make sense what I'm saying, guys? At the, and you notice that it's, it, that you see it narrows down, you see the tip of the, it narrows down to a smaller cross-sectional area for a reason, right? You, you don't want to have, you don't want to have it widened out because it's not going to squirt out as fast. You want it to be narrow to squirt out fast in order to go far. And so you need to, you can measure the areas, that's easy to do, just measure the diameters and calculate the areas, that's an easy thing to do. And then what you need to do is to measure the two Vs. And what you want to do is you want to have a student um, push in at a constant speed and have someone time how long it takes to do that. And you know how far they've moved their hand, which is how fast the water is moving. Does that make sense? As you're pushing on the, as you're pushing on this side of the, of the gun, you just measure how long it takes to go from here to all the way. And you take that distance divided by time and that gives you V1. And the A1 is the cross-sectional area of the wide part of the water gun. And how can I get V2? How can I get the speed of the water coming out of the... You just yeah, have to calculate at that point. I'm sorry, go ahead, Michelle, I apologize. 
if you know V1 and you know the two um, radii, then you can just calculate it. Yeah, you can calculate V2, yep. Yeah. Okay. Can't you just treat it as a projectile and it's yeah, and in that, freefall? And, and, that's, and that's the other two, those, those are both things. What Michelle and Kate said are the two things that I do is that I treat it as like I, I, if I were to throw a ball horizontally, I can figure out how fast I threw it horizontally if I know how high I am and the range. And so all you need to do is to see how far that stream of water goes and just keep it. I usually just have it be like two meters up or something. So it's the same height up. Okay. Does that show up on the screen, y'all, what I just wrote? Is this what y'all are thinking? Yeah. And what you can vary is you can vary how fast you compress the, the plunger. And all you're gonna need to do, what, what I have to do is I have to get buckets of water. And I just always ask the outdoor groundskeeper person, I say, okay, where's support? Can you open up, a, can you get a hose for me somewhere? So I can just fill up these buckets of water because what they, the kids have to do is they have to like suck up the water and then score them. And for me, it's fabulous for physics too because it's August. <laughs> uh, and for us in a couple of years, it'll be April, which won't be bad either. This will be nice to get outside. Um, I found these, a pack of 16 for $44 on Amazon. It was like the first. They're called crayon water guns. And they look like crayons. And what's also nice is these ones, I'm not sure if you can tell the, the tube is somewhat see-through, which is nice to be able to see like clearly what the distance that the, because you have to get, you know, like this distance here divided by time to give you V1, right? So you have to be able to kind of clearly see when the compression is done, like what distance has that plunger moved. Anything with water, obviously, I always make sure that, yeah, yeah, you know, I still kids in water. I'm just thinking that's prom season. We always have one of those like prom assemblies where all the kids are all gussied up and just imagining them getting sort of the water and you're getting a phone call from their parents. Any questions about this one, y'all? Once again, I start with the simulation and then I do this. Here's an example of a continuity equation from a previous AP Physics 2 test.
So this, this is an example of where we're not giving them the radius. We're assuming that it's kind of like a rectangular, that the river is a rectangle, right? And the depth is the same, but I've taken the width of the river and cut it in half, but it's the same depth. So the cross-sectional area should have been cut in half. And so since the cross-sectional area is cut in half, then the speed of the water should have been doubled. So from five kilometers to 10 kilometers per hour. Jennifer, thank you so much for that tip. I sure appreciate that. How much were they, Jennifer, on the on that site? How, was it was it sixteen of them in a pack? Um, what I saw was twelve in a pack, and it was forty five dollars on Amazon and thirty seven on Bowling. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yep. There you go. I have a question. Thank you. For go for it, Kate. Um, so can like I don't teach AP Physics too, but it seems like there's a lot of resources there. Uh -huh, Should I uh -huh. submit? Uh, uh, syllabus to get access to those like old so, questions or what? Yeah, that's good. That's a good. That's a good question. When AP Physics One uh, has fluids in it, all those questions will be in AP Physics One AP Classroom. Right, but like now to get. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, now there, you're right. There won't be. Um, okay. But you could say you're going to teach AP Physics Two. You'll just have your principal. You'll have to have your principal say yes. I'm teaching right. AP Physics Two. Okay. Yeah. And maybe they will actually let me teach it. So <laughs> uh, maybe so. The other thing I'd point out to you is the other thing I'd point out to you. I, I apologize. Just one other one. Other, I want to follow up on that question real quick. One other resource I wanted to point out to you all is I'm a big YouTube fan. And um, one of the things that they do every year is they have um, review videos on YouTube in April every year for all the AP subjects. And um, those review videos the last two years are available on YouTube. They don't have to, you don't have to have um, uh, access to a classroom. And um, the first video and um, the uh, second video, the first video from the first year and the first video from the second year, um, they're about fluids. So this is working fluids, multiple choice review questions. And then further down, it says everything you need to know about fluids, statics, and dynamics. Um, look at that, 15,000 views. 15,000 views. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's why everyone was around me after so 15,000 views. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Meredith, that's another good question, is that the hope is that there is not just a physics one workbook, but a physics two workbook as well. Um, and so for sure, for sure, there will be a physics one workbook with fluids um, and they've already started. <laughs> Other questions? While you're on YouTube, uh, another good suggestion for you is there's an AP Educators YouTube channel and the AP Educators YouTube channel is really fabulous um, because it gives you, uh, if you scroll down, there is, um, science, math and science, or actually just science, and it talks, it walks you through AP Classroom. And Matt, it reminds me, sir, you are also similarly world famous because I have your video about how to do the AP audit for all of my APSIs. So every APSI participant I've ever had, since you made that video about how to do the course audit, has watched that video about how did the course awesome, out? Awesome. Like, I, just, I just updated it because the menus changed a little bit. So there's a new version oh, of it. On oh, website. I didn't see it. I'll have to find it. I just put send it up about a week ago. Matt, you send me a link because I'll have to change my uh, canvas. I will. I'll, I'll do that yeah. right now while I think about it. I appreciate that, sir. The last relationship that we need to talk about in the next nine minutes is something called Bernoulli's Principle. And Bernoulli's Principle talks about how can I have um, water changing vertical height or how can I have water changing speed? In that, in that example that I was showing you of the water flowing through the tube, 
in this situation here. I have a change in kinetic energy. This is where we're talking about conservation laws again. The vertical height hasn't changed of the fluid. The vertical height is still the same, but I've got a change in kinetic energy. And I can't have a change in kinetic energy unless there's been work done. And so how can I do work? Well, I can have a difference in pressure since it's a fluid, since it's a liquid. And so in this situation, I've got it going from a uh, high speed to a low speed, a high speed to a low speed. So I've got a decrease in kinetic energy. And since I have a decrease in kinetic energy, I've got to have a higher pressure where the speed is lower and a lower pressure where the speed is higher. And so the pressure on the right is higher than the pressure on the left, which results in a net pressure to the left, which results in a slowing down of the liquid, a pressure difference. Similarly, if I were to flip those, you notice that the pressure on the left is uh, 600,000 and the pressure on the right is 500,000. So there's higher pressure on the left, lower pressure on the right. And so there's a net difference in pressure to the right, which speeds up the fluid. Also, if I have water going up or going down, I have a change in gravitational potential energy. And I can't have a change in gravitational potential energy without doing some work. And so I have to have a change in a difference in pressure in order to have a difference in gravitational potential energy and water go up or water go down. And all of this is combined into the dooziest of the dooziest of doozies of equations, which is this one right here. Unfortunately, it'll be the last equation you ever teach your kids in physics one, because it is a doozy. It's a lot. But really all it is, is work, kinetic energy, and gravitational potential energy divided by V, volume. If I think about work, work is force times distance. If I take work, just force times distance divided by area, not area, <laughs> shoot. Is it showing up y'all this time? Thank goodness, divide by volume. Volume is area times distance. So my distances will cancel and I get force over area. And what's force over area? Pressure. Similarly, if I take MGY and divide by volume, M divided by V is density. And finally, one half MV squared divided by volume is one half rho V squared. So all I have here are work values, gravitational potential energy values, and kinetic energy values. Why, that's why this is a conservation of energy equation. An important thing to know about the previous equation and this equation is that the previous equation, the continuity equation has to work. It has to work. And so if there's a bunch of stuff you don't know, you always start with the continuity equation and then go to this equation. I know I'm running short in time. I want to show you the lab that I use for Bernoulli's real quick. The lab that I use for Bernoulli's 
is, oh, first off, let's look at this. When you're doing Bernoulli's, you've got to do uh, curveballs and airplanes because curveballs and airplanes both have to do with differences in speeds of, of gases as well as differences in pressure. For airplanes, have your students make paper airplanes and have a contest to see who can, throw, who can get it to go the farthest or who can have it do the most loop-to-loops. Kids love that. It can offset the craziness and ginormousness of the equation. <laughs> and then also have your kids throw curveballs. That was baseballs, but with baseball-sized styrofoam balls that you get at Hobby Lobby or Michael's or wherever. Because every kid can curve a styrofoam ball. Every kid can do it. So for example, what I'm talking about is just taking, throwing it like this, like just taking the ball and throwing it like this, it'll curve like a champ. Or throw it and just whip it like this, or whip it like this, the, it'll curve meters, it'll curve. And it has to do with, and what it, it's dramatic. The kids that are like softball players or baseball players will lose their minds of how far they can curve the ball. And sometimes I actually go outside with a whiff ball bat and, but you know, you, you gotta get new styrofoam balls after that because a couple of hits with a whiff ball bat and they don't ever, you can't, <laughs> they're all crunched up. There is a lab that is a uh, simplification or a particular example of Bernoulli's called Torricelli's Law. And Torricelli's Law is if I have a two liter pop bottle and I poke a hole in it, the water is going to score it out. And as the water squirts out, the water level drops, the water doesn't squirt out, the soda doesn't squirt out as fast. And so what you can do is you can simplify Torricelli's or Bernoulli's equation, the Torricelli's equation. And I'll show you what that is real quick. So what I'm, in, what I'm suggesting is that if I have a two liter pop bottle, it has a little hole in it and there's water squirting out, that I can talk about this top spot being spot one and the bottom spot being spot two. Is that showing up in your screen, y'all, the writing that I'm doing? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Don't do it. It's 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 important enough that I want to I want to show you on. I know I'm running out of time. I, I, I promise I'll be done by five after. <laughs> Please show up. Okay. If I have a container filled with water, and let's have it be a two liter pop bottle, and I poke a hole in the bottom of it, that water is going to squirt out. And I have this two liter pot bottle on the edge of the table and the water is going to squirt out onto the ground. And my equation is P1 plus rho G Y1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus, no, not plus, equals P2 plus rho G y2 plus one half rho y rho v <laughs> two squared. So this spot up here is spot one and this spot down here is spot two. So at both spots at the top of the water and then pushing in on the water, the pressure is the same. So I can get rid of both the pressures because the pressures are both the same. The speed at which this water is going down, we'll call this V1, usually is really small in comparison to V2, which is the speed that this water is coming out here. And so I can disregard one half rho 
the one squared. Also, if this is y2 and this is y1, then y2 is zero and y1 is just the depth. So I can get rid of this on this side. And I end up with rho g y1 equals one half rho v2 squared. Which if you look at it, it's just conservation of energy. That you have gravitational potential energy of the water at the top of the container is converted to kinetic energy as it falls. And it's literally mgh is equal to one half mv squared, except it's densities. And in fact, it's the same density, right? So you can get that equation that you've seen before, which is not that one, <laughs> that, the density and that density. So you'll eventually get that the speed that it exits at is the square root of two g h which is the same equation that you used if you just drop a ball. Because what's happening is those water balls are dropping <laughs> through the container of water. And so what I can do is I can measure, I can figure out the exit speed with the same way that I figured out the speed of the water as I pushed on the water gun. This is called Torricelli's theorem or Torricelli's law. And all it is is a simplification of Bernoulli's with a bunch of assumptions. And all I use is a two liter pop bottle that I poke a hole in the bottom of it with a nail. And I just have them figure out how fast it squirts out at different depths, which you can do by just letting water squirt out and then measure it, the, then do it again. Let water squirt out and then do it again. Let water squirt out and do it again. And you usually get this relationship that you know, V squared is equal to 2GH, that the depth is proportional to the V to velocity squared. And all you need is a two liter pop bottle, a meter stick, and that is it. Because you don't need to measure, you just measure the depth and the range and the height, and you can get everything else from it. So just a reminder, we talked about the major terms and the various ways we quantify fluids. We talked about the different types of matter and what fluid is, a liquid or a gas. We talked about the different um, types of fluid studies, the fluid of studies at rest or the fluids of studies in motion, fluid statics and fluid dynamics, density, pressure, buoyancy, density, pressure, buoyancy, as well as fluid moving continuity equation, con the con conservation of volume, and Bernoulli's principle, the conservation of energy. The, all of this stuff, are I just took those two YouTube videos and smashed them together in one presentation. So if you wanna listen to what I just did again, just go to YouTube under advanced placement and find physics two and the two fluids videos are just me with the same slide deck that I've just merged into one. One thing that I have not done a lot of this session just because of time is done a lot of example problems. So the second year video, the first video under physics two is me going through a ton of examples. Which examples? The examples that are on the slide deck that Matt shared with you. I wanna thank everybody for joining me today. I sure appreciate the opportunity to interact with all of the amazing AP Physics teachers in Alabama. It's always a pleasure and honor to get to um, help you all and help your students however I can. And as I always say, if you have any questions about AP or AP Physics or Physics, please do not hesitate to email me. My email is other at fluidphysics.com. How apropos is that? Fluid with the pH because, you know, I'm hilarious. <laughs>